Good evening, one and all. I am Reverend Ronald Nathan. I'm the minister of the Hogad Amy Zion Church. Welcome to our studies in the book of Revelation, A Glimpse of Heaven, part three. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, we do thank you for this opportunity to be able to look into your word once again. We pray, O oh God, you would bless us and you would open our eyes to see that which is revealed in the book of Revelation. We pray, O oh God, that you will speak into our hearts and into our lives so that we will be living lives that are more pleasing to you because we have taken heed to your word. Bless each and every one who is on this call today. Uh, both here in Barbados and also those who are online. May you be with us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I am going to share our screen and uh, we go. Slide show. Okay. All right. As I said earlier, this is uh, the third part in our studies in the book of Revelation, A Glimpse of Heaven. And I'm Reverend Ronald Nathan. The revelation of Jesus Christ, the book of Revelation, is just that, a revelation of Jesus Christ. The books that spoke to the life of Jesus Christ in the New Testament, in the Gospels in particular, spoke of him as he lived and moved on the face of the earth, covering a period of three and a half years. This revelation, however, is of Jesus Christ on a completely different plane, no longer limited by the gravity of the earth. Jesus is in heavenly places. And John the Revelator, John the writer of the revelation, uh, speaks to us and gets an, a glimpse, an insight into heaven and what is transpi transpiring both there in heaven as well as even on the earth. Our recommended reading comes from Revelation, the fourth chapter and fifth chapter. I want to take this opportunity to read chapter four, which it consists of 11 verses. I'm reading from the New Living Translation, which reads as follows. Then as I looked and I saw a door standing open in heaven and the same voice I had heard before spoke to me like a trumpet blast. The voice said, come up here and I will show you what must happen after this. And instantly I was in the spirit and I saw a throne in heaven and someone sitting on it. The one sitting on the throne was, a, was as brilliant as gemstones like Jasper and Carnelian. And the glow of an emerald circled his throne like a rainbow. 24 thrones surrounded him and 24 elders sat on them. They were all clothed in white and had gold crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and a, the rumble of thunder. And in front of the throne were seven torches with 
burning flames. This is the sevenfold spirit of God. In front of the throne was a shiny sea of glass, sparkling like crystal. In the center and around the throne were four living beings, each covered with eyes front and back. The first of these living beings were, was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had a human face and the fourth was like an eagle in flight. Each of these living beings had six wings and their wings were covered all over with eyes, inside and out. Day after day and night after night, they kept on saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, the one who always was, who is, and who is still to come. Whenever the living beings give glory and honor and thanks to the one sitting on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down and worship the one sitting on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever. And they lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and they exist because you created what you pleased. The Lord will add his richest blessings to his word. The Revelation of Jesus Christ. If you wish, the book of Revelation is a series of highly dramatic prophecies that uses visions, symbols, and numbers to speak to the past, the current, and the future. Let me say that again. The revelation of Jesus Christ is a series of highly dramatic prophecies that uses visions, symbols and numbers to speak to the past, the current, and the future. We have been studying this book for the last two weeks, this being our third week, and we saw in the first three chapters that Jesus Christ is revealed as being at the center of his church. He's the one who knows everything that is taking place in the church, which is the body of Christ. At the time in which John received this revelation of Jesus Christ, we are told that he was on the Isle of Patmos and he was on the Isle of Patmos as part of the persecution of the Christian church in the first century. The Roman Empire, or I should say the Roman Emperor Domitian, following in the footsteps of the Roman Emperor Nero, instilled emperor worship in an attempt to try to unify the Roman Empire, which stretched from Great Britain all the way uh, in the West, sorry, all the way to India in the East and South to North Africa. So in his attempt to try to unify the empire, he instilled uh, emperor worship, and for many Christians, this was anathema, meaning it was sacrilege. They would not do it. And because of it, they found themselves being persecuted by the Roman emperor 
and his officers. As a matter of fact, there was a law, and I have just taken out one sentence uh, from that ancient document that says, no Christian once brought before the tribunal should be exempted from punishment without renouncing his religion. So the attempt was to get Christians to worship the emperor. And for that, they were persecuted. And John, the writer of the Revelation, after having been dipped in hot oil, he did not rescind his faith. He was exiled to the Isle of Patmos. The photograph to the right is a depiction of Christians being thrown into uh, various arenas where wild animals was allowed to rip them apart. Uh, in the middle of that picture is also a depiction of uh, people being tied to the stake and would be burned. But let's continue. That's the context or the political context of the book of Revelation. Uh, once again, I have the same picture on the left, but on the right, we have uh, what is called the Colosseum, the Roman Colosseum. You can travel to uh, Italy and go into this Colosseum. And I just wanted to contrast the fact that in the first century, this was a torture chamber for Christians in the 21st century, this is a tourist attraction. Not much unlike the fact that uh, many um, uh, properties right here in Barbados are now tourist attractions, which uh, three, four centuries ago, or maybe less, would have been slave plantations. But I just wanted to contrast the fact that in the first century, that's where Christians would have been massacred, tortured for their faith. Today, we pay money to go and visit this site, the Colosseum in Rome, where uh, many Christians would have been lost their lives. So, Let's, uh, I, I mentioned uh, in the first week, uh, something about the numbers in Revelation. I just want to uh, reiterate that as we go on to symbols in the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, you will find numbers repeated several times. And some of these numbers are even in other Old Testament books and they reflect a particular significance in the Hebrew religion and Hebrew tradition. One speaks about unity, two speaks concerning strength, three speaks about the Godhead, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, four speaks of a world number. Normally, it speaks about the ends of the earth, four ends of the earth, east, west, north, and south. Six is the human number of incompleteness. And of course, we are familiar with the term 666, which is a human number. Seven, a complete or perfect number. And we will spend some time looking at that today. Twelve, speaks about a religious number, whether it be the 12 tribes of Israel or the 12 uh, apostles uh, or multiples of the 12 as in 144,000, uh, those who are gathered in the heavenly place representing uh, the heavenly body uh, of those who have been redeemed. And the number 1,000 from which we get the word millennial, which speaks to the reign of Jesus Christ. So numbers in the book of Revelation 
have a significance and they speak generally to these themes. So you could basically anywhere in the book of Revelation that you see these numbers, it speaks to this particular um, uh, meaning or significance. Let me quickly move on because I want to highlight the number seven. Throughout uh, the book of Revelation, we will find the number seven. Already in our studies, we saw uh, the seven churches in chapter two and three. Uh, we saw the seven spirits. Uh, we are urged on seven occasions, he who hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the spirit says. Uh, the seven spirits, seven churches, seven lampstands, the seven stars, which represent the seven uh, messengers or angels of the church, seven lamps of fire, seven horns, seven eyes, seven seals, seven bowls, seven songs, seven angels, seven thunders, seven places where the word worthy is used, seven heads, seven crowns, seven mountains, uh, which uh, seven kings and also seven plagues. All of these, as I said, sorry, I think I missed seven trumpets, which was hidden behind my uh, uh, list of participants. All of these speak to the divine signature, seven speaking of that which is divine, all right? So again, what I am doing here is giving you tools to better help you to understand the book of Revelation. So we have the numbers, but and specifically this number related to the divine signature or seven. Let's move on. Let's take a look at some other symbols or visual representations this time. Not numbers, but symbols, visual representation, pictures that is given. Uh, John is beside himself trying to explain to people on the earth things that he's seeing in the heavenly realm through the spirit, okay? As we are told in the first verse of Revelation chapter four, all right? So he's trying to reflect, what can he use? How do you explain to people thing about things that are outside of their frame of reference or outside of where you are almost short of words. And so John has to use what he knows and what he knows that his readers know to impress upon them this out of body and out of this world experience. So he talks about rivers and lakes, gates, and cities, flowers and trees and seas, speaks about precious stones, gold and bronze. He speaks of the animal world, he speaks of human beings, he speaks of extraterrestrial beings. Say, Pastor, are you talking about aliens? Well, what does aliens really mean? It just means beings from outside of the earth and outside of that which we are familiar with. Okay, and as John explains, for example, uh, the four beings that he saw, uh, those are beings that we have no human or um, earthly um, familiarity with. 
So I call them extraterrestrial beings. And then he speaks about weather patterns and conditions. For example, in chapter four, that there is thunder and lightning. So as I said in the first or second slide, this is a dramatic presentation of prophecies using symbols, uh, visions, symbols and numbers to communicate the revelation of Jesus. So we are seeing Jesus, not gentle Jesus, meek and mild, but Jesus in his full authority and in a role in which there is a tremendous amount of activity. And let me say that in some people see uh, seven visions, others speak about Revelation as eight visions, and others even of Revelation as 12 visions. We'll have a discussion over that in weeks coming. But all of these visions tend to overlap. So Jesus Christ, who is at the center of the seven churches, who sees and knows everything, is the same Jesus who is presented to us as the Lamb of God, who is presented to us as the Lion of Judah, who is presented uh, to us in so many different ways in the book of Revelation. So you have vision upon vision upon vision, all having... Um, multiple meanings and overlapping. What excitement must have been in the heart and spirit of John as he sees all these different visual representations coming together. And let us not forget uh, the last verse of the fourth um, chapter, if I can quickly uh, get back to it, it tells us that the 24 elders would fall down on their face um, uh, and lay their thrones, um, crowns, sorry, before the throne and say, you are worthy, O Lord, our God, to receive glory and honor and power for all things are created by you, or for you cre created all things, and they exist because you created what you please. In other words, trees, lakes, gates, cities, flowers, trees, seas, precious stones, animals, human beings, uh, beings that we do not know of, even weather patterns and the whole environment, all of these were created for he who was, who is, and who is to come. So I hope that we would move um, away from the idea that the book of Revelation is not one that uh, we understand. I want us to become aware of the fact and say, yes, I am beginning to get a handle on what this is all about. Revelation 1 through to 22 is a revelation of Jesus Christ in all of his glory. And John is struggling to describe that which he has seen in a series of visions. Symbolic names are given to many things in the book of Revelation given in what we have already called uh, in previous weeks, apocalyptic writing style. An apocalyptic writing style is really a veiled or a coded type of writing used here to protect Christians from uh, the Roman Empire. So if this letter or this scroll that Christians would be sharing with each other because that's the pattern of how they didn't have a printing press where everyone could have the um, gospels and the letters and even this revelation given to them. It was normally handwritten on scrolls 
and send from one church to the next. And churches that could afford it would get a copy of that scroll handwritten and then send on the original to another church. And in the book of Revelation, Rome is called Babylon. The Roman emperor is called the great dragon. Those heads of nations that were supportive of Rome were called beasts. World history is described as a scroll. Who will be able to open the scroll or to read the book, we are told? Well, that's going to come. But the scroll is about world history. Okay, and we note that there will be several seals. Uh, if you look at the picture on the right, a seal was where some uh, type of um, uh, substance was used and melted to seal so that the scroll would not unravel. But on that seal would also have a stamp that would reflect the authority of the one who sent it. And so who can break these seals and open this scroll of history that we could gain access to it? And we'll find out that there's only one who could do that, which we'll cover in another session. The Christian church is called a woman in travail or in childbirth. Because the Christian church is trying to give birth to something, a particular message, uh, what we would call the gospel, and it's in travail because there's much pain and suffering, which describes a little about the context of Rome. Successive eras or periods of history is described as horses. So there's a gray horse and there's a white horse and a red horse, etc. All right. So again, we're giving you tools to which you are able to dissect and understand as we go through the chapters of the Revelation. We can get a sense of what the revelation is speaking about. Let me pause just for a little while to, if you wish, gain my breath and allow you to ask that burning question that may be on your mind and heart as you've heard me shared so far. Yes, sir. What I don't really understand is the great dragon. Why, why, why the great dragon? Okay, as I said before, it was a pic, uh, symbolic of the Roman emperor. Okay, um, why the great dragon? Well, I would say Domitian was a dragon in himself. But remember, we are using coded language and you're trying to protect those who are carriers of uh, this piece of correspondence that has to make its way all around the Roman emperor, Empire. Uh, at the time of writing, the Christian church had got into... Uh, northern and eastern parts of Africa. The Christian church has spread as far as that cold Arctic uh, island known as Britannia, what we would call today Great Britain, and throughout uh, uh, Asia, uh, even into India and parts of China. So the Christian church was spreading as rapidly as the persecution of Christians were concerned. So the question about why is that that was uh, the means by which um, 
John described what he was seeing uh, in heaven and its significance for the politics of the day. So the symbol for Rome is Babylon, but obviously it could not be Babylon in the literal sense because Babylon as an empire had been destroyed many, many uh, centuries before. Okay, so it is a code. And in speaking about the great dragon, you're speaking about the Roman emperor and what uh, he was doing uh, at that time. So if, if it is coded, which means in chapter four, all of these things, then these are codes. And out of the throne proceeds mm -hmm. lightning and thunders and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning. Before the throne, there was a sea of glass. So all these things is just, they, they, they mean something else then. Well, um, what, what we do know is, no, I, I made a specific point of saying that certain symbols, if I could go back a couple of um, uh, slides, I said that there are rivers, there are lakes, there are gates. Uh, John is trying to explain what he has seen in the vision. And he's seeking to communicate this to um, the church. And so he uses uh, um, statements about what he sees, for example, in chapter four, I saw a door standing open in heaven and I heard a voice that had spoken to me before, but it speaks to me like a trumpet blast. Well, mm -hmm. I, I, it, it, it is so dramatic. It is so loud. It is so... Um, uh, well, let me leave it at that. It is loud. So it's like a trumpet blast. So a lot of the things he's describing, he's saying these things are like in order to try to communicate um, the sense of it. But when we get to uh, the chapter that deals with um, uh, the great dragon, uh, he is speaking, yes, it is coded, but we have to understand that um, senior Christians would know that and as they are speaking from the letter, they would share that with the Christians, let me say in the pews, okay? But if it falls into the hands of the wrong person, they would not see, um, because already Christians were seen to be unpatriotic, if I can use that term. They weren't supporters of the empire. Now, it wasn't that Christians were not supporters of the empire. They were not supporters of emperor worship. And so hence, the codes had to be used um, to reflect certain political um, issues that were going. Uh, there is one other thing that I have not mentioned here that is important for us to understand. In 70 AD, which is about 20 years from the point at which Revelation was written, Jerusalem had rebelled against the empire. They had come against Rome and there had been several wars so that Jews and Christians were suspect as people who are trying to overthrow the empire. So they just had to be careful. I'm hoping that that has helped to explain uh, the symbolic nature of much of... Um, a little, a little. You can inspire me, I have a... I, I don't have a question, mm -hmm. but... I can honestly say that this season is the first time that it's all coming together for me. Because I was a little in the in the vein with with with, with Revelation, but I'm now as of me, I'm master that was in school, 
it finally coming. I'm finally getting there. I guess like bam, little by little. But you know, this this whole thing, I can see now why 21st century people, or I'm beginning to see why 21st century people are taking this whole dragon and the beast and using it, or 21st century, some 21st century Christians are using it once more, but they're not using it how John would have, I guess, would have been using it, or I'm confusing. You look a little perplexed. Hey, what's that? I mean, Pastor, look a little perplexed. I, I'm waiting for you to finish the uh, well, go, statement. No, because I don't. No, because you, you were saying two it, different it, things. Yes. Yeah, they're using it as as a, 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 a. They're feeding into the fact that people think that what you just said that Revelation is a book of gloom and doom, and right. they right and they're using it now to bash. They took the, like, the whole COVID. And the and using it as this whole thing as a way of trying to say, look, you see Revelation coming through. Look, this whole thing, Rome trying to um, Rome is trying to to bring everybody on the war religion and the whole conspiracy theory. Yeah. That was just yeah. my my statement. So yeah, it's it's actually coming making sense to me now. Okay. <laughs> okay. Anyone else? Before we move on. Okay, um, my, uh, my suggestion here, and um, for those who may not be aware, uh, you can now view the first two parts of uh, our study on our YouTube channel. And, uh, my intention with this series is to give you the tools that would allow you to better understand uh, the text, uh, it is possible for me just to say, okay, I am preaching from the text without necessarily giving you the tools to be able to understand it yourself. Because um, as has been said, uh, it is possible to go to uh, this book as to um, other books of the Bible and just extrapolate uh, certain things that may not necessarily be what the writer was intending to say, okay? So, uh, for example, many years ago, and I'm just using this as an illustration, uh, during the Watergate scandal uh, in the United States of America, uh, someone said, oh, well, the Bible had prophesied that. And when you ask where, they pointed to the book of Nehemiah and Ezra, where it mentions the water gate. Okay, now that was not the intention of the writer of Ezra and Nehemiah. As a matter of fact, Jerusalem was constructed as a walled city which was the type of architecture that cities had at that time. And there were gates in those walls to allow people to go in and out of the city. And one city, uh, one of those gates was located very close to a series of wells. And that is where water was brought in to the city. And sometimes where a stream was dug under the wall to bring water into the city. So you see, it is possible to go and take things from the Bible and try to apply them to present day things when that was not the intention. Now, it may very well be that the uh, nation rises and nation falls uh, points to the fact that um, some nations would rise and some nation would fall, but that was not what that text is about. And my concern is, and the warning given to us in Revelation 22, that we ought not to add or take away. When we do things like that, we are adding to um, uh, the scripture things that God did not actually say. So we just need to be careful. And that is why we ought to take time to actually 
study God's word. I want to quickly move on to, uh, I had mentioned, okay, there are scrolls that world histories depicted as a scroll, okay? Just as the Christian church is spoken of. So this is where the uh, symbols. So um, my saying to you, um, Sister Pam, uh, that uh, if you have um, some difficulty understanding the dragon, then that same difficulty ought to apply to the other um, symbolic um, things. So I would say, uh, that is what uh, a dragon would have spoken into uh, the, those times. We don't have dragons today, but um, the, we know of uh, back in history, those were mythical, um, uh, mythical uh, beings, okay? Uh, but um, we have to understand that they are given particular significance for the message that John wanted to present to the church as revealed by Jesus Christ or the revelation of Jesus Christ. Okay, uh, we continue with the symbols. There are 24 elders, heavenly authorities. Now, which authorities? authority of these? Um, were they representing uh, America or Russia or um, uh, Jerusalem or Syria? Uh, well, America didn't exist at that time. So we, we just know that they are authorities and they say to us that authorities bow down to the one who is on the throne. What is it that the text is trying to communicate? It's uh, communicating that he who rules, rules over all. The four creatures, high-ranking angelic beings with responsibility for the world because they are four. We know that four speaks to the world or to the earth, the four corners of the earth. They lead worship in that heavenly realm. And we saw the... Um, Worship holy, holy, holy. Um, and then the uh, 24 elders falling and laying their crowns before God. All of that speaks to uh, the all powerful uh, rulership of this kingdom of God. The king is in his kingdom and is sitting on his throne. So, uh, we come to what I call the conclusion of this um, study by saying that we see Jesus, uh, God speaking and presenting uh, Jesus Christ in this revelation and that through Jesus Christ, we have a, we address social, economic, political, cultural, environmental and spiritual matters pertaining to the world, the earth and the heavens, because these are related, all right? And it speaks about in the past, in the present and in the future. We saw in the last verse of chapter four that there is a link back to creation that all that exists was created by him and for him uh, to fulfill his uh, will and his purpose. So as if you've read chapter four and chapter five, you will see that this panoramic view, for well, this is just one of the visions, still have several other visions to go through, this panoramic view alongside the fact that Jesus is at the center of his church, what we looked at last week, now we find him in uh, this great expanse. Um, John could only call it a sea of crystal and glass uh, because the place is so brilliant. And 
uh, the noise is almost unbearable as you hear the shouts of like trumpets and lightning and thunder and uh, angelic hosts bowing. Uh, there's four animals, one look like an ox, one look like an eagle, one look like a human face. Uh, all of these are speaking towards uh, the magnitude of creation and that God rules in all of us. So the question that we are left with is how should the Christian church today engage social, political, economic, cultural, and spiritual forces? Because this letter, um, and I'm calling it a letter, let's say this document, uh, would have been circulated to Christians like you and I. Yes, they were in a particular context of persecution, but it had a message for the church. What do they do? Do they run away and hide? Uh, how do they engage the society? And from reading the book of Acts, for example, and the epistles or the letters written to individual churches and to individuals like Philemon um, and Jude and so forth. Um, in those are uh, instructions for how Christians ought to live. And if you look at Second Peter and Jude, you would already see that there is a sense of persecution of the church, but they still have to be the church. I close with the um, two symbols that we see on the left, uh, one symbolizing that we are to be sold in the earth and a candle that we are to be light to the world. Given the fact that a revelation of Jesus Christ shows us that Jesus is in control because he was, he is, and he is to come, and that there is a panoramic, if you wish, dramatic presentation of God putting things in place and dealing with all manner of things that are even beyond our comprehension in many ways. What are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to live? How do we engage? Because remember, Jesus said you are in the world. You may not be of it, but you are in the world. And through one of his parables, he told us to occupy until he comes. Amen. So I wonder if there are any further questions or comments that we would like to share. When I think of the instruction to be salt and light in the world, given what we have gone through today and the two other sessions before. Um, I know from what you said, it was the, the movie, the, the movie makers that, um, that seem to have taken the lead on explaining to society what the Bible meant. Um, and I'm thinking it, the movie makers, Hollywood wasn't called to be salt and light. 
So how has the Christian church leaders allowed somebody else to take the lead and be the light and the salt? Because what we, what it seems that we have been taught is so contrary. I, let me venture to um, see that the images, you see, they see a picture um, is equivalent to a thousand words. Mm. All right, images and in particular moving images as in films. Mm -hmm. Uh, are extremely powerful uh, mm -hmm. up until uh, the 19th and uh, early 20th century. The only moving images that we had was of people acting. Okay, so uh, Shakespeare, for example, uh, and mm -hmm. other um, actors in those times and there were actors from way back yeah? uh, so that was the way you dramatize a particular situation uh, but every film requires a, a particular type of interpretation what you will show and what you will not show um, and that's why films always differ to what's in the book all right mm -hmm. You normally have a book and then somebody makes a film about it. So the person making the film, uh, which is a financial investment, asks the question, what will bring in the greatest crowd and make the most money? Okay, uh, very, even if it is a, let's call it a, film about the Bible, okay? The other thing is they then say, how do we interpret that Bible? Not necessarily based upon what the original writer was saying, but what would be good film. Yeah, All but right? you're talking about the movie makers. Yes. You're talking about the movie makers. So where, where can we find what our church leaders have, even if they didn't dramatize it, whatever they did, whatever they did for us as the congregation, where can we find? Have they been silent or have they been following the movie makers? Well, um, I'm not sure that I can answer that fully. I could just say to you that there have been for example, we know that uh, uh, the Reverend Dr. T.D. Jakes have made a number of films. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, those films, again, are more contemporary films. Uh, of the film about uh, uh, the death of Jesus Christ by uh, uh, Mel Brooks, was it? Mel? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think Mel Brooks. Yeah. Um, okay. a, a lot of persons are on viewing that film. Mel Gibson. Mel Gibson, Mel Gibson yeah. thank you very much. Yeah, um, Mel Gibson. Um, a lot of people felt that that film was, should not have been shown under 18 years old because um, it was considered to be very um, gruesome. All right. Uh, the other thing is that films, no matter who does it, there is a film authority that has to either allow it to be released or not. Mm -hmm. there, there are some films that are not allowed to be shown to the general public. There are others that are linked to a particular age group because of some of the ex, um, uh, some of the activities that may go on in the film, for example. All right. Yeah. yeah. So um, governments also have a part to play in that. Um, and you're something like you protecting 
I, you, no, you, no, the, I the, am the, not the, protecting the, anybody. All I'm saying to you is <laughs> there are rules in regards to films. Yes. And but those rules they don't have are to go run to the by film. government. Right, fine. That's the film. That's, the, that's that industry. Where yes. can we go? Where can we go? Is it a museum? Where can we go as Christians to hear our Christian leaders? What were they, how, what sort of life were they being? Where were they telling us these things? Where? No, 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 no. We have to I, go to see no, all these theaters. No. Nowhere, because these things been instilled in us. That this, what you are saying, Sister Glennis, that is what we've been seeing. We are now seeing it portrayed now in a different light. Christians so we were supposed to go to the Bible. What do you mean we're supposed to go to the Bible? <laughs> you're no, supposed no, to no. read your Bible. Yes. No. We'll read. Bible. But, but, but the explanation... Exactly how it was explained to us and those before us. Yes. And, 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 and talking about the film, and talking about the film, part of it, then you, you would have had people like, oh gosh, what is his name? The, the fella, Kirk, Kirk. He would have done three or four films about based on Revelation. Um, and could, then, could Douglas? No, yeah. no, not Kirk Douglas. Kirk Douglas is an old man. <laughs> oh my God, Kurt Cameron, Kurt, Kurt Cameron. Oh, Cameron. He did about four films mm -hmm. about the revelation, but and he would have interpreted how he, he sees it, how he saw it. Right. Now to come as I'm older and I'm reading more about him and those start him. He is one of these very very far right evangelical ah. mm -hmm. people. So you gotta be really careful for truth because that is where you're getting your information. We're, uh, sorry, we weren't going to the Bible as we should because the visual was easier than reading Revelation. The Bible but tells person, us. Person started, person started to tell you about watching these same movies. So mm -hmm. I was I try looking at them to see what they were seeing. These movies, they're, they're not speaking the truth about what actually happened. That started to come out. Okay, so let, me, think, let, me let, let me continue as Sister Glynis says in defense of... Um, <laughs> <laughs> The movie makers. Um, well, it's not the movie makers at all. It's, I, it's I am. The I am. Leaders. No, the uh, church leaders. When a film come up, for example, um, very few church leaders take time to critique cultural forces. I mean, um, uh, and. Uh, Prime example, very few Christians will talk about uh, the need for culture or even understand um, why culture has a particular impact upon us, how culture changes and so forth. And um, film is part of um, the culture of Western society. And they may not critique uh, that particular film or uh, may feel that they don't have the knowledge to critique it, but the knowledge is there, okay? Um, so I, I am not going to try to defend because I don't know what they were thinking, but what I'm saying to you is, here are tools that allow the average person in the pew or outside of the pew to get a better grasp of the understanding of the book of Revelation. Oh. All right. Um, and none of, you see the other issue, and this is why I think I said it a couple of times and it may not have had the impact that it should, that the book of Revelation is part of the whole Bible. It is not, 
isolated from itself. So we need the rest of the Bible to also help us in keeping the visuals, the symbolic. Um, actually, the book of Revelation is good film. Okay, uh, it's just that John did not have the technology to be able to make good film, all right? Um, but he used words. So it is like this, it is like that. And almost everything on the earth is brought into this book to try to help us to understand that Jesus Christ is who he really is. Because this is a revelation of Jesus Christ outside of the persecution that is taking place uh, uh, with his church in the first century. So I'm not sure what other words you want to put in my mouth, Sister Glennis. <laughs> I'll put no words in your mouth. I, 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 it's just, it's just, it's quite a serious matter. I, I feel, I don't know. Well, it, you know what I, like, I, I'm it's sorry, oh, but it's almost like it's, it's unfair to previous religious leaders that who, who was responsible for teaching them so that they don't, mislead people it, it, it's, well, it's I, I, I am just saying that we go through different times uh, if you take for example the denominations that we have existing at the moment each denomination puts a spotlight on a particular type of emphasis or being church. It is not necessarily that all of what existed before was wrong, but this is something that has become, let me almost say it's trending at the moment. And so people follow that trend or, um, and so you have different things. For example, um, the person uh, you mentioned, Sister Michelle, um, a very few of those big films with um, Charlton Heston um, that picked up on biblical themes and so forth. Very few of those big films were done without Jewish money. So therefore, in its interpretation, it could not look at Israel in in negative fashion because it was Jewish money that was paying for it. So there are, and the same thing you said about being evangelical. Um, in the United States of America, evangelicals have a particular impact even on what is allowed to be made as films. All of the, so in other words, there are politics involved in every film. Okay, I did a lecture for um, a, a church in, I think it was East London on um, uh, Wakanda, all right, uh, or the um, film, uh, the um, Black Panther. And um, in doing that, what I was doing is taking biblical principles and applying it to cultural forces and um, saying, what does that mean in light of these cultural forces? Because um, culture is all around us. Sunday's sermon that spoke uh, to the issue of crop over is the applying of biblical uh, teaching or even using a biblical spotlight on aspects of Bajan culture. Um, there are folks who would say that, oh, we, all we ought to do is to look at the actual words of the Bible and not necessarily apply it to the, the context within which we are in. But that's not what I see in Revelation. In the book of Revelation, uh, John is talking. Uh, he's not afraid to call uh, certain people dragons or to speak of others as beasts 
but he's addressing the political realities and the persecution that Christians were facing at the time. And we have to do the same. There are all types of changes. Okay, um, the Bible has to speak to us in an age in which um, I suppose if John was here today, he would have had a drone going around um, heaven, giving us um, a good um, uh, oversight of what was taking place, but he didn't have those. So he went in the spirit and saw and likened it to things that he was accustomed to seeing. Uh, but we will have to speak in an age of robotics. Um, uh, I'm trying to remember, I was listening to a program that talk about the, um, uh, I can't remember the word now, something sphere. Um, uh, that a new reality that is being created by uh, uh, oh, huh? metaverse. Yeah, the metaverse. Yes, the metaverse and all of that. At some point, we have to address it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, uh, when we talk about economics, we'll have to deal with um, the crypto factors and cryptocurrencies mm -hmm. and so forth because they become a part of our reality. And mm -hmm. we have got to show and help our young people to be able to apply um, revelation to the new things that will arise in the 20, towards the end of the 21st century, um, God willing. Okay. But God is speaking. And that's what the last or second to last slide said. God is speaking through Jesus Christ to our world. And continues to do that. And the church is required to be salt and light. Salt that preserves, that brings up uh, the purity, that speaks and... Um, that seasons light, light that dispels darkness so that all can experience Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Pastor, yes, you close, no, no, um, before you close off, uh -huh. Don't go, don't leave when everybody else leave. Ephraim wants to sing with you. Yeah, I am recording. I was about to stop the recording. I know, but that's that. fine. Uh, hold on. Okay.